Today, I want to talk about this idea of attitude. I don't talk about attitude much. I went back through, uh, golly, 20 years of notes, which I can do very quickly in my computer, and just targeted the word attitude. It was only like in five different talks that I even used the word. But it, yet, it seems really a, a, an important thing to talk about. Some people say that attitude is everything. I don't think attitude is everything, but I think attitude is in integral to how we live our lives and what we get out of our lives. So that's the, what I want to pursue today. And I want to start with uh, uh, a spiritual icon named <laughs> Hank Williams Jr. <laughs> if you don't know who Hank Williams Jr. is, I don't know what planet you look No, that's not true. Uh, uh, if you've ever watched a, an NFL Monday night football game, that song that they sing uh, about... Uh, you want to, want to have some football or want to, whatever it is, that song they sing is Hank Williams Jr. out there acting crazy. Uh, and he wrote a song called Attitude Adjustment. <clears throat> it's kind of racy, kind of sketchy, but I'm going to read you some of the lyrics out of it just so you can get a sense of, of how some people experience this idea of adjusting their attitudes. I met an old friend in a bar the other night. He got a little drunk and he wanted to fight. So he jumped up and challenged every man in the room, and just about the time he got the words out, an old boy jumped up and closed his mouth. He used his head for a mop and his butt for a broom. It was an attitude adjustment. I guess it was his first time. An attitude adjustment. Now he understands just fine. He got bent out of shape, and he opened his mouth, and just one appointment straightened him out all right. It was an attitude adjustment. Oh, it'll work every time. <laughs> attitude adjustment. So that's the thing about attitudes, is that it's, a, it's an integral part of who we are that we bring attitude to our lives. And it is not separate from what's going on in our world. There, it, it plays the same role in uh, the experiences we have in our lives that our thoughts do. And of course, that's what the science of mind teaches, is that your thoughts are what creates your experience. Well, so does your attitude. And your attitude is really a mixing of your thoughts and your emotion. And when you blend those two things together, you get attitude. Yeah, you know how it goes. Uh, you wake up and you're a little grumpy in the morning. And you get in the shower and the, the, it wants to be cold too long. And you get your coffee and it just doesn't taste right. And you get in traffic and everybody's a jerk. And you get to where you were going 10 minutes late, so you have to defend yourself. And the day goes like that and it keeps getting more and more that way. And it, pretty soon you're thinking the whole world's against you. Now, maybe some of you have transcended that and never fall into that trap anymore. But I think most people do. <clears throat> I think most people still have that thing where they can fall into some kind of a downward spiral and get stuck in having a miserable day. You do it long enough, it'll become a lifestyle. And every time you do it, every time you get into that place of thinking something is wrong and your attitude is moving in that direction, you're adding to the problem. Because what's coming back at you is simply, as Barbara said in her piece there, is simply a reflection of what's going on inside of you. So you're going to get back just as much as you put out, or maybe quite a bit more because the universe is so generous, <laughs> so willing to support us in having the things that we're giving to it with our, with our ideas and our energy and our, our actions in so many ways. So it's an attitude adjustment that we require. Now, here's one answer that I found online that you can look at and think about maybe this would solve the problem of an attitude adjustment. <laughs> but if it's not in your uh, uh, life to suddenly go off to Tahini and stay there indefinitely, uh, maybe we need to look at something else. Consider some other way to approach this. So that's what we're going to do today. Now, first of all, I want to talk about how this all fits together. This is, uh, well, okay, we don't even need to spend time there now. This is the process that I believe we all go through all the time in our lives. And I want to direct us to the top of the screen, which says beliefs and personal consciousness. 
That is the sum total of everything that you believe, everything that you hold as real in your world. You know, you hear that thing about reality as though it's a concept uh, that some people have and some people don't. That's not true. We all have a reality, and it's real to us. That's what makes it a reality. And that's what we get with our beliefs and personal consciousness. <coughs> I believe that, that that idea of consciousness, if we compare it to a computer, is the hard drive. It's the sum total of everything that's been stored there. And of course, in our case, we have access to the limited knowledge of the universe through the one mind of spirit. But pretty much, we tend to stay in what we've already experienced and what we already believe. Only on occasion do we actually open up enough to receive some new information and to actually adjust our, uh, our beliefs. Now you see, beyond that, you've got attitude. And then thoughts and ideas and feelings and perceptions. Now to me, those three areas contain what you call in your computer RAM, your random access memory, the stuff that changes very quickly, whatever's on the screen, whatever you want to call up, that's all your RAM, and that's is changed just very quickly. The part that's your, that your hard drive doesn't change that quickly. You can add to it, but it takes some work to go in there and find stuff and take it out. You have to be very conscious about that. <coughs> but mind really is the collection of all of that. Then we start moving from what we're experiencing internally to what we're expressing out into the world, and that takes us towards and actions. That means we're taking those beliefs that we have and that mental attitude that we have and all of the conscious thoughts that we're thinking and the feelings that we're having and we say something or we do something and then the whole world can see what's going on with us. And of course, we think we're absolutely right with all of that. Maybe. <laughs> But what comes from those, all of that that comes before it, is outcomes. Things happen. Things, and as Barbara said in her piece this morning, everything that you're experiencing in your life is a reflection of what's going on inside of you. So your outcomes are yours, even the ones you detest, even the ones that scare the poo out of you, are your reflections. They all exist because of something that you either thought or an energy that you, that you played with. You may not have done it consciously, but it comes from you. There's nowhere else it could have come from. So everything you're experiencing is a total reflection of your consciousness, of your attitude, of your thoughts and your feelings, and that's where it shows up. And then what's left? Well, the thing happened and you react to it. And then what? After you react to it, well you get more of the same. So one might say this is a vicious cycle. That's why I did it this way, to let you know that this doesn't end. So where can you change? If you don't like what's happening over here in outcomes, where can you change? Well, you can go to your beliefs, but as I've said to you many times, if I ask you what your beliefs are, you can't tell me. You can't tell me until they apply to the, the, the experience you're having in the moment. Then you know exactly what you believe. But before that, it's just not easily accessible. You cannot make a list of all your beliefs. And God knows you have thousands of them. So that's not a place to really correct anything. Obviously, you can change your thoughts, and that's a conscious thing, and, and affects your going back into your, into your hard drive and, and making adjustments. Either that or you're going you're gonna to have a thought, not hold on to it, and go back to the thing you believed before. You can do the same thing with feelings, but a place you can really do the work is at the point of your attitude. Now, some people will tell you that they, they are aware of their attitude, but I still think we're not that all aware because we're running through life and mostly our attention is on what's out there and we're reacting to what's out there and we forget that what's out there is a reflection of what's in here. So our focus is over there, but that doesn't help. But when we bring our attention to the attitude we're bringing to the moment, we actually can adjust it. We can do it differently. But we have to be aware. We have to be conscious of that. We have to know that's what's going on. So we're going to play a little bit of that with our thinking today and see how that looks. <clears throat> so, let's see. It must be time for an attitude adjustment. I would... I would suggest to everyone in the room 
that there's something in your attitude that you could work on that can make your life work better. We all know how to have an uplifting moment except when something is going on that we don't agree with. And I tell you, we can't just do this in an unconscious way. It won't work. And if your attitude is kind of pissy, you're not going to have the joy in your life that you claim you want. If you're walking around poor-mouthing, saying you don't have enough, you're not going to find abundance. It doesn't work. If you're, if you're claiming something is wrong in your life, that's your focus. And you're going to get more of that and a whole lot less of the thing you say you want. So we need to make some adjustments. Each on its own way. So I'm going to go through, I think, there's, I think I've got eight things to talk about, eight reasons uh, to consider an attitude adjustment. I'm not suggesting that all of us ha have need of all of these eight things and, or should look at them and they would move us. But my guess is there's going to be something in there that you can use. So find the thing that will work for you, that will help you, that will, that will give you the opportunity to go, oh, I could change this. Let's see how this goes. And if you haven't noticed... Whenever I get up here and share these kinds of concepts, it's only because I need to hear it. <laughs> and I figure if I need to hear it, maybe many of you do as well. So let's go through our eight reasons here. Here's the first one, my favorite. When you think other people need an attitude adjustment. <laughs> maybe that means you need an attitude adjustment. So when you find yourself arguing with people, disagreeing, finding fault in other people and seeing them as somehow less than. <coughs> the, the challenge, the thing that's really going on is the perception you're putting to it. And what it's doing is it's keeping you from being who you've come here to be because you did not come here to argue and find fault in other people. Nobody came here to do that. So when you're doing that, that should be a clear indication there's something to work on here. I had a, uh, a call from a lovely person this week. And as we were talking, she said to me, everything in your house is, is, is organized. Everything's put away. Everything is immaculate. I could never let you come over to my house and see my house unless I spent days putting everything away and cleaning everything up. And I kind of laughed because I, I said to her, I have my way of doing things. And that, it just, it's just the way I'm wired. I want things put away. Everything's got its place. When I'm not using it, that's where it is. So that when I want it, I can go find it. I like order in my life. But I don't find fault in other people's state of being. My first spiritual teacher taught me that everyone has their own sense of order. And some of it looks chaotic, but it is their sense of order. And you've seen people who have desks piled up with stacks of paper. And chances are they know exactly where the thing they're looking for is. And they can go right to it, even though it looks chaotic. So I don't judge people for the way that they, they keep their space. That's their business. And I found that very helpful to keep me from falling into judgment of other people and to being in the state that would keep... that would create a separation. Because when we do that, when we have this sense that someone else isn't doing it right... What we're doing is just creating separation from them and missing something juicy, something wonderful about them. So I invite you not to find a fault in other people, not to think that they need some kind of an attitude adjustment. And the way that I would suggest doing this is an old neuro-linguistic programming idea called uh, perceptual positions. And the way perceptual positions works is if you see somebody doing something that you would just not do, you would not agree with what they're doing. You may even find, be, find yourself offended by what they're doing. Do that old thing called walking in someone else's shoes. Now ask yourself, so what is it in their life that would make that way of being important right now? What is it that they're working on? that they're seeing, that they're knowing, that they've experienced in life, that causes them to want to, to have that thought or take that action. And if you do that, you'll, you'll have a much better chance of coming to an understanding of who they are and why they do what they do than you would otherwise. Certainly by making them wrong, you'll never get there. And in my life, 
I find it's really helpful to be in, in good working relationship with the people around me, to have good communication, to be able to share openly, and, and to, to trust what they say. And what I've learned is that I can trust people to be true to their nature. So that if I've had someone lie to me or give me false information about something, chances are they're going to do it again. And if I get mad about it, well, how's that going to work? Am I going to get mad about it every time they do it? Or am I going to just say that's who they are? That's what they do. That's how they live their lives. They're not bad people. They're good. They're wonderful people. They just have this different way of doing it than I do. And that seems to take all the pressure off. So when you find yourself in a place where you, you want to judge somebody for the way they're being, step into their shoes for a minute. Look at how their life is going and what's with And you may not find it, but I want to guarantee you that God's in the midst of that somewhere. That divine presence is right there in the midst of it. And if we're feeling challenged by it, that becomes our work. Because often in life I've found when, when I'm faced with something that does not feel congruent with my life, that that's an opportunity for me to look at my life and see what I can learn about me. And out of that, I get a result that does work for me. So finding other people wrong is not the answer to anything that's going on in your life. All right, number two. When similar issues arise with, with more than one person, in other words, again and again and again. The classic ex example of this is when your second spouse and your third spouse, all, both at, their, at separate times, start acting just like your first spouse. Even though they've never met. Even though they just don't know each other or anything about other than what you've told them about the others. But it's almost like they've got some secret coven somewhere and they're working diabolically against you. But that's not the case. The common denominator is you and me. So if we see something happening, issues happening with someone over and over again, it's because of us. Because we're calling that into our lives. Because there's something to heal here. And the work with it is to heal it is to find it and make it right. Let go of the judgment. Let go of the problem. And what I've found in my life is when I stop making somebody else wrong for what they're doing, for what they're doing, they often stop doing what they're doing. Because I don't need to hear it anymore. I've worked it out. It's a clear indicator for me that if they stop it, I've done my work. And until they stop it or they leave, it's still work for me to do. I found that incredibly helpful. So when you see that same thing, push that same button in you again and again and again, just a different face and a different time, the work is in you, not in them. They're just, they're just being your reflection, which is what life is. All right. Ah, when we complain about our life, Oh, when we complain about our life. This was mine. This is what started this whole talk. <laughs> Last week, I got an email from a member of the center. I got an e someone that I, I adore, someone that I love very much. And what she was saying to me in the email was, it was time for me to retire. Which, of course, at first pissed me off. Like, who are you to tell me when I'm supposed to retire? But I looked at it, because that's what you got to do. you gotta, you got to say, what's going on here? Because the superficial surface stuff is very seldom what's going on here. And what I realized was that I was walking around regularly saying, I'm exhausted. I'm so tired. I, I'm, a, I'm overwhelmed. I, I, I can't get everything done. i got to get done. You say that enough times, and life will start reflecting it back to you in ways of saying, like, so go away. Ah, it was brilliant. It was wonderful. And of course, I sat down with that person uh, a day or so after that email came, and we looked at it. And I explained that. I said, I see why you, you think that's what I should do. The way I've been acting, the things I've been saying, you, you know, that, that seems perfect that I should, should go ahead and pack up and get out of here. But I don't want to. I'm not ready to. It's not time to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my attitude. 
I'm going to start cleaning it up. I'm going to start remembering how good my life is. I'm going to start remembering how much love I have in my life, how much good I have in my life, how many wonderful things are happening around me all the time. Do I have a pile of stuff I got to do? I do. I have lots of things that are mine to do. Thank God for Margo and, and April. They come into my office on a regular basis and say, what are we taking from you now? <clears throat> and they do. They do. It used to be that I'm the one that organized who did everything on Sunday morning. And they said, not anymore. We're handling that. And I resisted. And I didn't like some of the choices they made. But you know what? <laughs> it has made my life infinitely easier. And they continue to do that for me. So I am deeply grateful for that. And I will continue to look at that and see how that works. Because this is important. It is important that we that we remember who we are and remember the good in our lives. Here's a little exercise you can do if this is one of your issues. If you find yourself complaining about how hard your life is or how, whatever, so any kind of complaints, ongoing complaints in your life, create a scale like from one to 10. And on the 10 end of the scale, the hard end of the scale, think of something disastrous, something horrible, something that would just be like the worst thing that could happen. And don't just leave it to yourself. Something like the end of the earth. You know, meteors coming here, it's going to explode the earth, we're all going to be gone. That would be like a 10. Then look at the thing you're complaining about. Where is it on that scale? <laughs> Chances are it's a two or a three. So, how significant should that be? How much carrying on should you be doing about it? Probably not much at all. You know, in fact, what I would recommend is looking at it and reframing it because I guarantee you that whatever it is, God's in the midst of it. God's in the midst of it. So in that, somewhere, there's some lesson, some awareness about who you are and how your life is going that will help you get stronger and clearer and have a much better life. I believe that all of the challenges in our lives are simply opportunities to remember the truth of who we are and how good our lives are, how wonderful our lives are, how many blessings we have. I've gone to, to uh, uh, ending all of my emails and my letters with the phrase, uh, so many blessings. My life is filled with so many blessings. And if I take time to complain about something, then I've forgotten that. I've forgotten how good it is, how wonderful it is. And my guess is you have too. So go back to remembering all the blessings and it'll change that for you. And it'll make those disastrous, catastrophic things that you think are going on go away. <sighs> Number four. Oh, I left a word out, or a letter out. It should say, when we think others are better off than us. Anytime we think that others are better off than us, that they have a better life, that they're happier, that they're, uh, they're richer, that they're uh, doing a, a better, having a better job at living life and feeling, then fun, suddenly feeling sorry for ourselves, we've stepped into a, a mud pit and it does not serve us because it's all about choice. I guarantee you if, so, if you observe someone and say, that is a happy person, they have chosen to be happy. It's not because everything works for them. They have chosen that way to be. And when things aren't working for them because they're a happy person, they work it out quicker than you do or I do because they're happy, because it's easier to make life work from that place. So if we're seeing other people that are doing it better than us, don't resent them. Emulate them. Figure out what they're doing that's making that work and do the same thing or do your version of it. But don't get stuck in that idea that somebody's got a better life than yours. Yours because you are the same God being that they are and they have no, no advantage over you in the structure of the universe. We all get to pick our way of being in the world. And if yours isn't working out as well as you'd like, work on your attitude. 
See that your life is working out. Know that about yourself. Live from that place of knowing and see what happens. I guarantee you it will change. Barbara, uh, God, I'm really referring to your, your, uh, your, your message to us today. That, that idea of in two months everything changed because she changed. That's how it works. That's how it works. We, what's going on on the inside is always what we're seeing on the outside. We don't like what's on the outside. Don't point to that. Don't focus on that. Focus on your, yourself and what's going on. And I don't mean inside your body. I mean inside your consciousness. And see how it comes out different. If you're going to have attitude police in your life, you should be uh, the, uh, the captain of the police. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that's catastrophizing. All is lost. All is lost. Every, and, you know, something happens. The plate falls and spills. Oh, my God. Oh, it's so bad. Oh, everything's messed up. My life's a mess. You know, if we play the game that way, we'll get a messed up life. And if we'll just remember the truth of who we are and live from that truth, this becomes a non-issue. There's nothing to do with it. Everything is never lost. Everything is always here. It's all God. It's just about the way we're looking at it. And the way we're looking at it is based on the attitude that we're looking at it with. When we defend our position without thinking and defending our limited beliefs is something that we all do. Yeah, yeah, but. Yeah, yeah, but. You know, that's not what happened to me. I, it was really hard. You know, we, and, we, and we will stand up to somebody that says, no, you've got a great life. No, I don't. I have a hard life. I have a terrible life. It's just not working at all. How, who does that help? Who, who, in what way does that make anything better? It doesn't. And what I was finding when I was talking about being exhausted is that I was getting a lot of sympathy. <laughs> My teacher taught me that sympathy... Is, is a crutch. And what, what the way it works is that when somebody is sympathizing with you, not empathizing, but sympathizing, that they're actually seeing themselves as better off than you. So they're joining in on your sense of, of that, uh, that you have problems or I have problems. And they're going, yeah, you poor thing. That's so sad to see you having to go through all this. You're a mess, aren't you? You've got a really hard life. I'm glad I'm not you. In fact, I'm not going to get very close to you now. That's sympathy. That really is, by definition, what sympathy is. So don't sympathize with people. If, if you see someone that's trying to get you to do that, telling you how hard their lives is, tell them you don't believe it. Tell them you know better, that they've got a better life than that. If maybe you shouldn't say anything. I know. But if you're going to say something, tell them that their life's better than that. They may like it, look at you like a deer in the headlights, but it's the truth that everybody's choosing their path. You get to choose your path. I get to choose mine. We're all doing it our way. We want to change it. Attitude may be the place to look. The seventh one is when we focus on what could go wrong. Yeah, yeah, but this thing couldn't, could not go through. We couldn't, it could be that we don't get the money. It could be that uh, what's going on with, the, with the, the creek bank. We've been doing all this planning and getting permits and getting ready to do all this repair out there. And as of our little visit from uh, Storm Fred uh, a week ago, a little over a week ago, uh, we, have, uh, we have new damaged area. Oh, no, all is lost. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, we're never going to get this thing fixed. It's going to cost too much money. We can play all of that game, but it, none of it's true. In fact, the board is playing with an idea that this may cost us a whole lot less to fix than we thought. You don't know till you look. So anytime that you find yourself focusing on what could go wrong, what you're doing is you're feeding something going wrong. You're setting up, you're creating an opening for something to go wrong. And, and that's, you know, so many possibilities. Spirit will find something to go wrong. If you want to create the opening, Spirit will fill that with some nasty, ugly thing. If that's what you want. Is that what you want? It's not what I want. I don't, at least most of the time. And the last one is, when you get angry as soon as something goes awry. I have found myself doing that. Uh, I think I use the example of dropping a plate. 
fume and going into a rage. This is terrible. Damn it! Blah, 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 blah. What does that mean? It means that there's this underlying attitude that you're playing with that life is not working. Stop it. Life is working. It's working perfectly. We use that word perfect around here a lot. And I, I think the general population doesn't understand that. The general population thinks that the word perfect means that it's turning out just like I wanted. That's not perfect. What it's doing is it's turning out exactly according to your consciousness. Some people don't like to hear that. They don't want to take responsibility for that. But it's the truth. It's perfect. Life is a perfect reflection of our consciousness. So when it's not working, it's our job to fix it at the point of us. And when we do, we get a result. We get a result that works. So I looked for a, a Holmes quote on attitude. I found only one. And it was quoted from a lecture he gave many years ago and was published in Science of Mind magazine. And I want to share it with you. This is the attitude we should assume. That life holds nothing against us. It dires, desires only our good. It wants us to be well, happy, and successful. But it wants us to play the game of life the way it is supposed to be played. In unity and cooperation with others. So that's our founder giving us some direction on how to have the attitude that will get us the best life that we could ha possibly have. So perhaps this week, take a little look at your attitude when something goes a little weird, a little sideways, and see if you couldn't do that a little better, just by knowing who you are, just by remembering the truth, and just by loving yourself no matter what, because I love you very much, and so it is.